I appear to be. Uh, there are many more flattering angles to me, I assure you. Uh, please, uh, please focus on the brilliant words coming out of my mouth, not the strange, scary creature you see on the screen. Um, so what I want to do today is I want to talk about the three ways that you could deal with a nuclear Iran in policy terms. Uh, the first of these is that you could accept Iran as a nuclear state and implement a policy of deterrence and containment uh, to stop any aggression or expansion they might engage in. The second is that you could not accept Iran as a nuclear state and you could engage in preventive attack on their nuclear infrastructure. Uh, and the third thing you could do is you could have a negotiated settlement of some kind, uh, in particular the deal that is currently on offer right now and we're talking about today. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to briefly lay out some of the pros and cons of each uh, policy option, uh, and then we can maybe pick up and debate about uh, exploring those further uh, as need may be. Um, so, option number one, deterrence and containment. What is that? Well, uh, it's basically a set of threats and promises to Iran and to regional allies and partners that we might have. Uh, basically promising that we will defend any state that uh, at least is friends with us, that Iran threatens with conventional aggression once they have a nuclear weapon. Uh, and that furthermore, we will threaten nuclear retaliation and or regime change against Iran should they ever use a nuclear weapon uh, in, in the region. Uh, uh, the, the pros of this policy is that we would use this policy to great success during the Cold War. Uh, that is, we deterred and contained a far more powerful and far nastier state than Iran, uh, the Soviet Union. And, uh, and it seemed to work pretty well. Uh, people were very pleased with that policy. Uh, it's sort of gone down in US history as one of our great strategic achievements. Uh, pro number two would be you would avoid the costs of preventive war, which could be large. Uh, and furthermore, uh, you will be able to take advantage of the natural tendency of states to balance. That is, a nuclear Iran would be threatening and scary to all kinds of states in the region and out of the region, uh, and states in the region and extra-regional powers like the Europeans, the Russians, and the Chinese would have incentive to cooperate with us in deterring and containing Iranian expansion. Uh, so those are the pros. What are the cons? Well. Will anyone believe us? Uh, the, the great problem with deterrence and containment is making your threats credible. And during the Cold War, our alliance with Europe, the NATO alliance, was a long-running saga of us trying to convince our friends that we would do something crazy for them. That is, expose our cities to nuclear attack if there was a war in Europe. Uh, and uh, we used to call it uh, the, the conundrum of whether the U.S. would really trade Boston for Bonn. We constantly claimed we would, and no one ever really believed us. Um, so how much more likely is it that we're going to trade Kenwood for Kuwait, or Mason for Mecca and Medina? Uh, not very likely, most people would say. Um, furthermore, the one thing that made people sort of believe our promises in the Cold War was that we stationed hundreds of thousands of troops in Germany, which was the most likely place for a hot war to start, uh, giving us some skin in the game if the Soviets came across the red line. Uh, we just got done with a long series of engagements in the Middle East that convinced us that stationing American troops in the Middle East is a bad idea. Uh, it was one of the things that really ir irritated al-Qaeda before they attacked the United States on 9-11. Uh, it does not please people who live in the region today, uh, and so it's unlikely that we would send troops back. Maybe that makes our threats and promises less believable. Um, what happens if people don't believe us? Uh, well, the Iranians may act out. They may try to engage in conventional aggression or nuclear blackmail uh, to states in the region. Um, but moreover, our friends might take steps of their own to protect themselves, which could destabilize the politics of the region. Uh, so Israel already has a nuclear weapon. Uh, if Iran were to get nuclear weapons, you would have the potential of an arms competition between two nuclear states um, with possible preemptive incentives on both sides uh, and a probable end to Israel's nuclear opacity, wherein they don't admit that they have a nuclear weapon. 
Um, moreover, other states in the region that are technologically and economically sophisticated, states like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, would have incentives to get nuclear weapons of their own. Uh, and you could see a spiral of proliferation in the region. Uh, you might see conventional arms buildups on all sides. You might, would also almost certainly see an intensification of the proxy wars that you see in the region right now. Um, so the bottom line is, is that there's a chance that if we tried to contain and deter Iran, and we're not believed yet. Just keep going. Let's stop timing. Yeah. Oh, sweet. That's cool. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, there could be a, a spiral of military and political hostilities uh, with us holding the bag, trying to make more and more commitments to get more and more people to believe our promises, uh, but without necessarily securing the benefits of people actually believing them. Uh, and war could be a possible result. It would certainly be more likely in such a scenario. Okay, so what's the alternative? Well, another alternative is preventive attack on the Iranian nuclear infrastructure. That is... We could use air power to launch an aerial attack on major Iranian nuclear facilities, uh, in particular, Natan, Fordal, Isfahan, and Iraq. Uh, these are facilities that Demshah just mentioned. Um, we might also, in addition, hit different Iranian industrial facilities that could be used to reconstitute their program after it was destroyed. Uh, and we might also hit Iranian military assets that could be useful uh, if they attempted to respond uh, to our uh, warlike behavior. Um, the pros of a preventative attack. Uh, it would certainly delay the program for some amount of time. Uh, you get a debate about how long, but I think three to five years is a reasonably conservative guess. I think we would certainly destroy all the sites that we decide to hit if we decide to do it. Uh, it's possible the delay could last even longer. Uh, it's very hard to put together a nuclear program. It's not clear to me that if we took it apart, the Iranians would have an easy time putting it back together. Um, and we would get to avoid this world I just described of spiraling uh, arms races and proliferation among other regional states. The cons. Uh, if we bombed the Iranians, it would probably only convince them that they wanted nuclear weapons more than they might believe now. Uh, as one of my students once put it to me, you can't bomb desire. Uh, and you might have to bomb again and again and again. That is, you might have to, every few years, trot out the air power weapon uh, and bomb the Iranian facilities, which will become more difficult over time, especially if they require, acquire a real air defense. Uh, furthermore, you may see dramatic escalation of the resulting war. Uh, that is, both the United States and the Iranians might start with a campaign of limited violence that expands over time and in size and intensity. Uh, the Iranians would have incentives to unleash their proxies, Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, they would have incentives to hit American troops in the region. They would have incentives to attack uh, oil fields in Saudi Arabia and to try to uh, close the Strait of Hormuz, out of which most of the, uh, through which most of the world's oil flows. Um, and we might not be able to stop ourselves from responding uh, in a very serious way. Uh, we might end up in a long and protracted conflict. That conflict would be catnip, perhaps, for the world's terrorists. Uh, and other major powers would likely be very upset with us. They certainly wouldn't want to help cooperate with us in the aftermath of this. Uh, and they might even try to impose costs on us. Um, but what does that leave? That leaves the deal, or some kind of negotiated settlement. Uh, it's just what Dinshaw described, that is, there will be serious limitations on Iranian nuclear infrastructure and their nuclear program. Uh, and their development of nuclear technology for a period of about 15 years. Uh, this comes with a fairly rigorous inspection regime to make sure they're not cheating, uh, and extensive monitoring of the Iranian nuclear fuel cycle from soup to nuts, more or less in perpetuity. Uh, in return, Iran gets sanction relief, sanctions relief <coughs> and a path to being an NPT member in good standing. Uh, the pros. It's not either of the previous two options, <laughs> which no one really likes, which are kind of just tasteful for, for, for several reasons. Uh, not doing a deal at this point uh, is basically tantamount to be forcing yourself to choose one of the other two options. That is, there's probably no better deal that will appear on the table, and if this deal were to die, we would probably not be able to assemble the international coalition that brought it about, uh, at least not in the near term. 
Um, it would also delay, at a minimum, the Iranian nuclear program uh, for at least 15 years, and time is valuable. Lots of things happen over time. The regime may change. Even if the regime doesn't, the preferences of the regime may change. And it could potentially be the beginning of a new relationship with Iran, uh, a new cooperative relationship towards dealing with common interests in the region, like fighting ISIS, which everybody hates. Um, what are the cons? Briefly, what if Iran cheats? What if they obey the deal? What happens after 15 years? Iran gets to become a member of the International Community of Non-Proliferation Treaty in good standing, <coughs> which means they can very, very quickly assemble the materials necessary for a nuclear weapon should they choose to do so. Um, and finally, we're going to let them off the mat in economic and military terms. That is, they're going to be able to acquire more arms, and they're also going to get a big financial and economic boost to their economy. This will free up resources that they may use for mischief. Um, so those are basically the downsides of a deal. Uh, and so my last comment and parting will be to say that when you think about the deal, you need to evaluate it in relationship to its alternatives. Uh, and if you prefer one of the alternatives, that is an excellent reason to reject the deal. The deal may not work. Um, if you find the alternatives distasteful, as many people do, that's a reason to give the deal a chance. Um, but we can talk about that further in Q&A, and I will drop the mic now and turn it over to Rich. Thanks, Brent. Why don't you mute on your side, and we won't touch the technology on ours. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. I don't have my notes in front of me. Ethan. Ethan. <laughs> yeah. From our department. I'm going to speak over here so to avoid the embarrassment of the fact that I have no PowerPoint uh, to share with you. Um, good evening. And uh, I'm going to talk more about Iran specifically uh, and sort of what this deal means in the context of Iranian history, specifically the history of the Iranian relationship with both America and Israel. Um, there's been very little coverage of this issue from experts, uh, which I find surprising given that what this deal means for Iran is almost as important for us and for Israel as what it means uh, for America uh, and for Israel directly. Uh, and the vision that most of us have of Iran that we get in the media, anyway, is, is a caricature of an army of millions of turban-wearing fanatics who spend their days thinking about how to destroy Israel and America. Um, the reality is a lot more complicated than that, and I'm going to try to bring us a little bit of that now. What I want to emphasize is that... Hey, Ethan, would, it, would it be... Po I'm sorry, but would you be able to stand over here? So that Sorry way, to hear me? Well, that way... Um, he can't. Brandon can hear okay, no problem. Yeah, is that okay? Uh, that's fine. All right. Yes. Sorry. Can you hear me now? No, no pun intended. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so what I want to emphasize is that the relationship between... Is, excuse me, Iran and Israel and the United States, has had a lot of ebbs and flows historically. It's not always been hostile. Uh, it's had a variety of motivations that have driven it. Uh, I also want to emphasize that the current uh, tenor of Iranian politics and Iranian relations with uh, these two countries is as much a product of contingent historical circumstances at specific moments as it is of deep structural factors or ideologies. And I want to emphasize that Iranian nationalism and a very, very nationalistic country and set of politics is as important to what's going on right now and to understanding Iran's position on the nuclear deal as their religious emphasis, which is what gets much more attention. So this is a very brief history of relations between Iran and the U.S. and Israel. The early relations in the 20th century uh, between uh, Iran and these two countries were, on the whole, on the whole quite positive. Uh, the, there were two monarchs who ruled Iran from 1921 to 1979, the first, uh, Reza Shah and his son, uh, and they really sought to westernize Iran, they really sought to modernize Iran. Uh, they also were very nationalistic in ways that linked back to pre-Islamic Iran, which had a very storied history as the Persian Empire, uh, as many of you may know. Uh, and they really sought to create a kind of sense of national consciousness uh, that would be felt very deeply and that would not necessarily be so closely connected to Islam. 
and particularly uh, the second Shah uh, was very close to the United States. Uh, he came to power after the Second World War, uh, and by the early 50s, he had a close uh, alliance with uh, both the British and the Americans. Uh, there was a uh, democratic election in which uh, a leader named Mohammad Mossadegh was uh, elected in the early 1950s in Iran, who was a left-leaning socialist. Uh, because of the concerns of the Cold War uh, and the growing alliance between Britain and the United States uh, with the Shah, uh, he was overthrown in a coup. Uh, and uh, this is well known to many people. It's certainly uh, one, uh, but only one of the reasons uh, that generated hostility among certain segments of the Iranian population toward the United States. But during the next two and a half decades, while the Shah remained in power, the alliance between the United States and Iran and security cooperation between Israel and Iran uh, in some ways grew ever closer. Uh, the United States secured permission in the early 1960s that all of the Americans living in Iran could be governed by American law rather than Iranian law. This was a huge concession. It's not normal. Uh, I think most of us know. Uh, and it was very unpopular over time. It was really attacked by uh, the clerics in Iran, particularly uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, who eventually led the successful revolution in 1978 to 1979. Um, and there were a series of attacks against the regime <laughs> in significant part focused on the closeness of the regime with the West, the westernizing tendencies of the regime and its policies. There was a so-called white revolution that began in the 60s that was meant to urbanize and industrialize and modernize and secularize Iran in a variety of ways. Um, and these things were fiercely attacked. Uh, there was a famous uh, book uh, written which translates either to uh, Western toxification or occidentosis, depending on, uh, in either case, a poisonous thing coming from the West, destroying Iran, uh, is the idea. Uh, and so not only was there this close relationship between the government uh, and the West, but there was also growing hostility among segments of the Iranian population toward this relationship. This is what I would call phase one of this uh, relationship, uh, and it goes from the late 1940s until the late 1970s, the time of the revolution. By the eve of the revolution, there are 50,000 Americans living and working in Iran, and 16% of Iranian imports are coming from the United States. So it's a huge, huge sector, really, of Iranian society and economy uh, that, that's affected. <coughs> the Iranian Revolution, 1978 and 1979, as you may have heard, was uh, one of the really seminal events of the late 20th century. Uh, it was a religious revolution, which was not at all inevitable. Right? That, that's the thing that, that we don't necessarily realize. But many people in the mid-1970s in Iran thought there was likely to be a revolution. Almost no one, almost no one, literally one well-known expert, predicted that it would take the form that it did. Okay, people talked about a socialist revolution, they talked about a liberal revolution, they talked about a, maybe, you know, moderate Islamic elements in the revolution. Almost no one thought that it would take the form that it did. Um, the insulation of the mosques of Iran from the secret police, which was very powerful, was one of the big factors that made the revolution take the form that it did, because that's where energy gathered, and the charisma of Ayatollah Khomeini, which was extraordinary. So following the revolution, very unclear whether or not the United States is going to be able to remain on reasonable terms with Iran, given all of the anti-American energy related to the revolution, and this leader we had supported for so long had been overthrown. The Iranian hostage crisis, uh, which lasted for 444 days in 1979 to 1980, uh, really completely destroys any hope that there might be, thank you, uh, that there might be ongoing positive relations. Uh, and there's virulent anti-Israel rhetoric from Ayatollah Khomeini, as there had already been uh, before he came to power. Uh, there's an idea of exporting the Islamic Revolution uh, by supporting, creating, and then supporting uh, Hezbollah, which really makes its name by firing rockets from southern Lebanon into Israel for years and years. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that Iran also remains what I would call a rational actor during this time. In 1982, the Lebanese Shiites want Iran to support them with arms and the Iranian army during the Israeli attack on Lebanon. Iran refuses to do this. It's, most people believe that Iran acquired biological weapons during this time. Still has them today. They've never made them available to groups like Hezbollah, who are their proxies, right? 
because of the fear of what kind of <coughs> regional complications, retaliations that could create for them. The other central event in the 1980s that's very important for the current hostility between America and Iran is the Iran-Iraq War, during which we supplied billions and billions of dollars worth of arms to the Iraqi army. Uh, and of course, this was a, a bloodbath in terms of the number of casualties uh, for uh, both sides, and this created a lot of resentment as well. Ayatollah Khomeini dies in 1989. This leaves a huge vacuum. It's worth noting very briefly that his successor, Ayatollah Khamenei, who is still in power today, was only decided upon in the last months of his life. The man who was expected to be his successor, Ayatollah Mantaziri, was much more concerned about human rights, much more concerned about women's rights, much more concerned about the idea that the Islamic Republic was not living up to the ideals of Islam, which is one of the reasons that he ended up getting booted. But the point is, here's another moment where things could have gone differently. So we enter a third phase in the late 1990s with the election of Muhammad Khatami, who really ran as a reformer. Uh, Iran, yes, does have elections, and while it's very hard to get on the ballot, once you do, they have mostly been relatively free and fair. And uh, Khatami was really interested in detente with the West, uh, reached out to the United States in a variety of ways, um, including uh, actually helping against the Taliban in Afghanistan after 9-11, uh, and sending this very sort of fascinating, uh, in some ways painful to read now, note uh, in 2003 uh, that indicated what Iran was willing to negotiate over. Suffice it to say, it was right after we had conquered Iraq. We have never been stronger in the region since, and Iran had, had a lot more things on the table than ended up getting negotiated in this agreement. I can talk more about that in the question. But uh, partly because of the fact that Khatami's advances are rebuffed, uh, partly because of domestic problems, his, his, uh, after he's uh, elected to two terms, when his term ends, we had the next era, the Ahmadinejad era, which was, of course, very different. Uh, and Ahmadinejad and his rhetoric toward the West and toward Israel uh, obviously really poisoned uh, the environment very deeply. But I would just like to say again, we saw on the screen in the first presentation that Iran went back and forth in its nuclear program during this time. Uh, they had certainly moments where if they wanted to race for the bomb, they could have. They had very few inspections that were taking place during most of Ahmadinejad's time in power when he was using extremely aggressive rhetoric all the time toward the United States and toward Israel, and they never did. Uh, and so I would argue in closing that we're obviously in a new era. Uh, this agreement looks like it's going to go forward. Um, that's, that new era started with the negotiations between Rouhani and the United States. Um, but what we need to understand is that this is a pragmatic agreement. The approval of it by Ayatollah Khamenei, who has a final word, is very much based on pragmatic interests. It's not uh, based on some ideological shift. Uh, and Iran's ultimate goal, I believe, many experts believe, in seeking to get somewhere close to a nuclear weapon is regional hegemony. You have to go back to how nationalistic Iran is and how much they believe in a very glorious national past that they want to resurrect to understand that their goal is not even necessarily to have the weapon and certainly probably not to use it given all of the strategic deterrence. But the fact that people will know that they have what nuclear experts refer to as breakout capacity, if they're at, say, 90% enrichment, will be enough of uh, a deterrent. Um, so I don't predict any great uh, reform of the uh, internal dynamics of Iran in the short term, uh, but at the same time, uh, we'll see what the longer term future holds. Thank you.